Frank Herbert's Dune is consistently referred to as one of the most influential science fiction stories in recent history. The film set to release in 2021 is further proof that it has endured the test of time. There are a variety of factors that contribute to its legacy, but I think we can safely say a major aspect is its impressive world building. There's the desert ecosystem, the monsters within it, the cultures, the spice. But if I had to say one thing that made Dune special, it's the setting. Deserts are fascinating and dangerous places. How do our characters survive in it? How can the desert function not only as a backdrop, but as an antagonist? It's coarse and rough and irritating, and it gets everywhere. There are a number of ways a setting can be antagonistic. The threat of frostbite during winter, disease in the marshes, the restricted movement in mountains, rain in the forest, or in the case of deserts, the ever-present need for water. This, along with food and shelter, are the three basic requirements to survive anywhere. A normal, non-magical human can survive three to four days in the desert without water, but that's not without difficulty. You'll need about a gallon of water today to keep functioning, and even more if you're on the move. One day's worth of water weighs just about nine pounds. So if you're planning a trek across the desert, you'll have to lug a lot of weight to survive, and carrying all that weight is bound to make you pour with sweat. Survivalist Ray Mears conducted an experiment with the Institute of Naval Medicine, where he found that when exposed to conditions similar to the midday Sahara Desert, we need to produce approximately 24 ounces of sweat every hour to maintain our body temperature. This water needs to be constantly replaced if we are to survive. Without the evaporating water on our skin to keep our body temperature down, we'd likely be dead within an hour. This problem presents a unique opportunity for world building. In Dune, the Freemen have developed interesting and unique ways for storing and preserving every drop of water. While out in the vast deserts, they utilize still suits, a bodysuit that collects and processes all fluid expelled from the body. Yeah, uh, all fluids. Once reprocessed into drinkable form, the water is available to the wearer through drinkable tubes. This creates an innovative, effective, yet slightly gross way of being able to work and move amongst the dunes. Those people who can't convert their own sweat and urine into drinkable water will have to subsist on small pockets of moisture they find while traveling. Oases and underground springs are in all but the driest deserts. Desert flora and fauna need water too, so they tend to be nearer these sites. A common misconception is that you should drink the juice from cacti if you need water in a desert survival scenario. Don't. Most cacti are incredibly toxic and will kill you. Sorry, Sokka. Drink cactus juice. It'll quench you. Nothing's quenchier. It's the quenchiest. So probably don't eat or drink from the cacti, but like I said, they can probably lead you to water. Speaking of eating, even the desert has things that won't leave you rotting in the hot sun. Though not particularly appetizing, insects are an excellent source of protein. Most are safe to eat, though not all. In Mad Max, we see maggots as a key source of protein. Some delightful communities put great effort into creating maggot farms, where ripe corpse chunks are left out for the flies to grow their larvae. Aside from that, you can try to hunt something bigger down. Lizards, snakes, and tortoises all live in deserts, and most can be eaten. Catching them can be tricky, especially when you're trying to conserve energy and sweat, but if you know how to build a trap, you may be rewarded with a fat, juicy reptile. Although, beware of salmonella. Many reptiles are practically covered in it. It's not only possible, but highly likely that you could survive days in the most inhospitable lands only to die of salmonella. Oof. As for shelter, we don't have many options in the desert. If you're building a desert society, you might want to research actual locations like Timbuktu or research cultures like the Nabataeans, who hid water cisterns in defensible locations throughout the desert. More on them in a bit. If you're looking at a survival scenario though, you need to find shelter from the sun. The desert sand not only saps water from your body, it also conducts heat. You need to build something to separate you from the sand, or dig down to a cooler part to avoid it baking you from the bottom up. Next, create some shade. Sunlight on exposed skin dramatically increases the rate of perspiration, which is why you often see locals fully covered in desert communities. 
These coverings are crucial for the head and face because the sun doesn't only beat down on you from above, but also reflects off the sand and into your eyes, causing sand blindness. It's effectively a sunburn of the cornea. Remember when I said a setting could be antagonistic? This is the kind of stuff I was talking about. Fortunately, you can counteract this by reducing the incoming visible light by around 90%. So I hope you packed your best sunglasses. An often overlooked aspect of desert travel is night. The temperature can be brutal after the sun goes down, often dropping below freezing. The desert sand loses its heat quickly and you can be at a risk of hypothermia within hours of the sun going down. That's right, hypothermia in the desert. So that was a lot, and we can't cover everything about world building and deserts. So if you wanna know more about survival and world building deserts, do your research. Keep an open mind about what you can add to the setting in your world. An abandoned desert palace provides great shelter and is infinitely exciting to explore. A sandworm provides a less abstract threat than the sun and lack of water. And if your main character can kill it, it's good eaten. Imagine not just what the setting is, but what it could be and what was there before the story even began. That being said, let's look at a couple other types of environments that people have a hard time surviving in. Things like the Arctic, marshes, mountains, and forests of your world. What civilizations can thrive there? Remember when we talked about the city of Timbuktu and the Nabataeans who hid their water around the desert? Those are just two examples of ways people adapt to their environment. In an episode of the podcast, Writing Excuses, Ellie Modisett Jr. said this, but the other thing is that the environment underlies pretty much everything that nobody ever thinks about. What your environment is, call it your climate, what you do that informs things in terms of pollution, sometimes it changes the whole structure of a culture. The environment of cultures shapes everything from their tools to their agriculture. Let's see how intense climates affect societies around the world. For the next part though, I'm gonna throw it over to Jaron from World Building Magazine. Further north than Dixon, Russia, Resolute, Canada, and Syropolit, Greenland, is Svalbard. Its capital, Longyearbyen, sits at 78.2 degrees north and is the perfect place to look at how civilizations function in Arctic environments. So what's it like to live in a place like that? Well, residents endure winters that are permanently dark and summers that are permanently lit with sunlight. Polar bears pose a legitimate threat to anyone who leaves the city's streets. Unless you're going with an organized tour, it is required that you carry a gun and know how to use it whenever you leave Long Irbian. Although Long Irbian might seem normal on the surface, getting goods there is a hassle which drives up the cost of living. And this isn't just about getting fresh fruits to the local grocery store, this is about medical supplies and anything else they can't get locally, which is most things. We've already spoken about surviving in the desert, but what about living there, specifically in medieval Africa? The city of Timbuktu leveraged its control of the gold and salt trade throughout the desert and stood as the capital of several West African kingdoms, including Songhai, Ghana, and Mali. Although the climate has significantly changed since its heyday, there's no doubt that its status as a powerhouse of desert trade and its access to water was the secret to its flourishing. Then, of course, there are the Nabataeans of Arabia, who hid their cisterns throughout the desert. Back at home in their capital of Petra, they carved channels into the rock walls and made more cisterns and reservoirs lined with cement to ensure that water wouldn't leak away. They left no possible water preservation method unexplored, carefully creating systems to capture water from flash floods when they came. Terraces controlled runoff systems and erosion, allowing the Nabataeans to cultivate drought-tolerant plants such as olives, figs, dates, and pomegranates. I'd like to think that Frank Herbert's Fremen would have been proud of them. The Iroquois at their height stretched from modern-day western New York State to the St. Lawrence River Valley near what is modern-day Montreal. They lived among the forests and they hunted and used pelts to stay warm during the winter. But they're perhaps better known for their unique construction of longhouses, which can stretch up to 300 feet long. Inside, compartments were constructed for several families to sleep with a long aisle down the middle. At the heart of each, the Iroquois would place a fire for heating, cooking, light, and would put a little smoke hole in the roof. While living in a less extreme climate did have its advantages, the forests weren't without their own dangers. Animals, rain, snow, and more were plenty threatening, and the longhouses provided a safe place for them to go, and were easily constructed from what they could gather from the trees. Thanks, Jaren. 
Before an unknown catastrophe felled the Mayans, the Amazon rainforest was home to a booming empire with flourishing cities, vast agricultural output, and intellectual breakthroughs. Although the region the Mayans controlled is often thought of as a jungle, the Mayan heartland was actually an infertile wetland before they built canals to drain the excess water and raise the landscape. These floating gardens allowed the people of the Amazon to support agriculture and provide land for urban areas. Meanwhile, the medieval state of Venice didn't let marshland halt its progress either. The Lagoon community was originally founded as a trading post and later became home to Roman refugees who band together to create a republic in the face of local threats. Rather than eliminating the marshes or covering them up, the Venetians relied on the disease-infested swamps to help defend them from attackers. They built bridges, canals, and stone fortifications. They integrated with the sea rather than overcoming it. With their incredible navy, they were able to control substantial portions of Mediterranean trade and exert control over the Adriatic Sea. A cursory glance at a map shows us that mountain ranges, like rivers, make good borders. Mountainous terrain is difficult to cross and easy to defend, and the cultures that arose in it were often distinct, with roots reaching back centuries. The Basque people of the Pyrenees Mountains were responsible for Charlemagne's only real defeat at the Battle of Revenus Pass, Rencevue Pass, Rencevue Wa Pass, French. But the Inca Empire is perhaps the best known mountain based civilization. The Andes Mountains had an enormous impact on Incan civilization. They built roads and terraces into the mountains themselves, traversing valleys by bridge and eking out a precarious living on the mountainsides. Andean civilizations did not use wheeled transportation. With so many stairs and rope bridges to traverse, carts and wagons were impractical. So they developed a system of runners to lay information and found other ways to transport goods. Well, sir, he said after a moment of silence, since then I've been in war in Germany, in Spain, in Russia, in France. I've certainly carried my carcass about a good deal, but never have I seen anything like the desert. Ah, yes, it is very beautiful. What did you feel there? I asked him. Oh, that cannot be described, young man. Perhaps I am not always regarding my palm trees and my panther. I should have to be very melancholy for that. In the desert, you see, there is everything and nothing. Yes, but explain well, he said with an impatient gesture. It is God without mankind. A setting should matter to its story and characters. Sometimes it will push back and test them. Other times, it will provide. As the desert drains a person and exhausts them, it also contains the tools for survival. Oasis to quench your thirst, bugs to eat. If you are willing to spend the time, one can build a society given the right tools. We've seen it before through the Nabataeans and the Mali who use inventive architecture and trade in their environments as a means to not only survive, but prosper. In fiction, Dune is an excellent example that shows us how to use these same concepts in new ways to challenge the characters and enrich the setting. The setting is something to be defeated, something to be mastered. The setting is the antagonist and a character in and of itself. Thanks for watching. The script for this video was written and edited by Adam Bassett, Jaron J. Petty, and me, Levi Johnson. It's based on articles from World Building Magazine written by J.D. Venner and Eleanor Connick. We loved exploring their work about how to world build in harsh locations, but we couldn't fit everything into one video, so make sure you go check out the newest issue of World Building Magazine, link down below. This video is edited and animated by Cole Field. I'm Levi Johnson. Thanks for watching.